So now let us begin. Our first session will be taken by Professor Janani Shri Murali Dharan. Uh, she is a faculty member in the Mechanical Engineering Department of IIT Bombay. So over to you, ma'am. So um, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this open form workshop. Um, it's going to be six days of, I hope, a very informative, uh, very varied a number of people giving you talks. So um, today, uh, we have kind of divided the project or the workshop into days of, uh, you know, introducing the con different concepts of CFT, which is um, firstly meshing, then simulation. Even in the simulation part, we've kind of divided it into flow-based um, work versus heat transfer and some maybe advanced applications like multi-phase. So we are trying to give you a range to be able to later on be able to learn on your own and be able to carry out your respective uh, research problems. We might not be able to teach you the specifics of your research problem, but we will give you the tools to be able to develop things on your own, okay? Um, with that uh, initial statement, um, I just want to know, you can all type in the chat box, right? Um, if you've ever been um, exposed to CFT before, which is computation fluid dynamics, you can just say a yes or a no. Right. So I see a lot of yeses, which is which is going to make my job much easier. Um, great. So um, the next question is: When you say you know CFT, uh, do you? Is it a commercial software front end, or do you know? what the back end of a CFT code looks like. Okay. Okay. Some commercial front end only they know. Some people know both. Okay. So a lot of you know the front end, right? And uh, and I'm guessing there are some popular commercial softwares which will easily help you to do the um, CFD activities. Uh, but it is actually the back end which controls the physics, controls what you simulate. And for your own research problems with increasing complexity, um, it gives you more control of the numerics. So it becomes important to be able to uh, do the background as well. But you know, when you're trying to write your own code in C, C++, the challenge is, you know, to write a code from scratch takes several years. So if you're trying to do complex industrial problems, which is what companies want to do nowadays, it becomes very difficult to be able to code um, purely from scratch. So I think open form, um, open form is a middle ground which helps. Uh, it has several inbuilt solvers, you know, meshing capabilities, multiprocessor capabilities, which will help with your, um, you know, complex problems. But it is also set in a framework that needs us. It allows us access to the background which also means you need to understand what the backend is a little bit more uh, careful. So it is both an advantageous point as well as it comes with some responsibility of learning what is the background. So today um, in my lecture, uh, we're going to start off with um, the overall goal of this first part of this uh, workshop in day one would be to get you to run an open form simulation, which has already been set up. And look at um, 
how these problems are set up and what is the back end of cfd and how does it map on to open form because this basic understanding is very important before you dive into the different aspects of open form okay so with that let me start sharing my screen yes so what i would like to talk about today right is about cfd with a view of what is there about cfd in open form okay so we all know right um, back, backbone of cfd would be the three equations of mass momentum and energy conservation equations correct so let me take a conservation equation uh, which is like momentum right so that is typically a system called f is equal to ma correct so when you're talking about f is equal to ma um we all know that this is an equation pertaining to a system like a body an apple right um so we're talking about f is equal to mass times acceleration of that entire body a rigid body correct now we are moving into something called fluid dynamics okay where this um systemic approach is very difficult how am i going to talk to you about flowing mediums how are we going to witness flowing mediums changes in it and then model it right so one way of doing it is i take small particles and i follow through with the particles as it travels through the domain so that approach is called the lagrangian approach you would all know right um but you know that's computationally quite intensive so we would want to rather uh, be able to in most industrial problems um use a less computational intensive so i don't want to travel with every particle but i'll just stand in my position and have a control volume and have flow coming in and out right and i'll observe in my window my control volume what is happening to that flow is it accelerating is it decelerating what's happening so that is called the eulerian approach or a control volume approach okay so now i'm standing here and i'm looking at fluid come in and go out now how do i write f is equal to ma for this because it's a window it's just a viewing window and something is going past so f is equal to ma for what right so then i need to be able to convert this systemic f is equal to ma to a, a control volume perspective which typically is done by something called the reynolds transport theory okay so what have we understood till now you have conservation equations which you are solving right mass momentum and energy but you have to understand that they have been derived from systemic laws okay but they are not systemic laws the way they have written it they are control volume based approaches and this conversion has been done through the reynolds transport theory so let me stop here does anyone know about um, you know type reynolds transport theorem so there are a couple of yeses yes yes so good okay there's few people who say no okay so somebody has a confusion between reynolds transport theorem and gauss divergence theorem good point um so anyone want to tell me what the reynolds transport theorem says in verbally very vague verbal any one person can just unmute and say one who's really confident of yeah anyone abhishek hello yes abhishek or sarvesh anyone can speak up yeah, yeah. reynolds transport theorem is connected to the system approach to the control volume approach correct that is true um which is probably what uh, we have discussed at this point can you tell me what are the two terms which will be there in the reynolds transport theorem 
there is a uh, change in derivative of the property with respect to the time is the that equals to the change in the control volume of that property and mm -hmm. uh, adding to the uh, change in uh, surface uh, integral of that uh, property. Very good, very good, very good. So, um, so with that, let me segue because Sarvesh has kind of placed it in perspective. Right. So the Reynolds transport theorem essentially says that there is a rate of change of something of the system. Okay. Now that is equal to something related to the control volume. Okay. So how do you relate something changing in a system to a control volume? As two terms. What are the two terms? Change of that n, small n being the property per unit mass. Okay. Specific property. So change within the control volume plus change across the fluxes. So essentially what are you saying? In a control volume, I will categorize the change equal to what is changing within the control volume and what is happening across the surface. Okay. So if you think of some nuclear ex uh, example, you have flow happening inside and outside. Water is carrying the heat, but you also have heat being generated inside the control volume. Okay. So now you've brought a change for a system into a control volume using these two terms. So without going into too much of detail, I'm just writing the conservation of mass and momentum in terms of these parameters. Okay. So what are these parameters? First, I'm applying the Reynolds transport theorem to the mass approach, mass conservation. Okay. So for a system with no phase change, I can say that rate of change of mass in a system is zero, right? But that is equal to what is the change within the control volume plus what is the flux across the surface. Okay. Now let us look at momentum. Okay. So, um, so you have conservation of mass, which says that the systemic change is zero, right? But that can be divided into change across the control volume and change in the fluxes, okay? So this is your flux term and this is your temporal term, change within the control volume, change with time, okay? Now you have the momentum conservation. What is your momentum conservation in the system? F is equal to ma, right? So what are the forces F so what do these two terms represent? Anyone? Anybody? What these two? They are forces. Ma'am, uh, they represent the net surface force and volumetric body force. Correct. So these are forces which happen on the surface. So this could be shear stress or normal stress on the surface. Plus there is a body force, gravity related forces. So F is equal to MA, right? So MA is change in what? So we would look at velocity, right? Momentum change, correct? So we say that change of the momentum within the volume and across the surface, okay? So very important first concept that we need to understand, fundamental concept. Conservation laws are systemic laws. And they have to, for CFD, be converted into a control volume approach. In most cases, if you're taking the Euler in approach, and if they have to be the control volume approach, then this systemic law will result in two terms. Change of the property within the control volume and what is the flux across the surfaces. And hence, when you write this using the Reynolds transport theorem on your conservation laws, which is mass, momentum, then your Navier-Stokes equations come into play, which is the control volume perspective of the phenomenon. 
Everyone's okay till this point. Any questions? Okay. So I presume there are no questions. So let us move to the next part. So I have just written, written the governing equations in in which form? Control volume form, right? And I have the mass, momentum, and energy. Now there are two aspects in CFD that one needs to be aware of. One is the mathematical form and other is the numerical form. Okay, what do I mean by mathematical and numerical? When I say mathematical, let us take the momentum equation. Correct? Um, you can say that, uh, actually, I'll talk about the numerical form first because that is most intuitive. So when you look at this momentum equation and the energy equation, do you see certain um, terms are identical? Maybe I could underline that. So if you see this term versus this term, okay, and maybe this term and this term, right? They seem to be identical, correct? So that means that this form of equation is depicting a common phenomenon, okay? Numerically, numerically, they seem to have the same form. One is a divergence and the other is a Laplacian. Okay, mathematically. So then what, what is the phenomenon these two terms depict? Anybody? Uh, one is connective and the other is uh, diffusive terms. What is the other. first one? Which one? What was the first one? Uh, convective and uh, diffusive. Yeah, okay. So let me just correct you. It's advective. Advective. Okay. Advective. So the first one is the advective component and the other one is diffusive component. What do we mean by this? We are saying that essentially some something, some property, okay, is advected means there is a bulk movement. So when you're doing fluid movement, there are two types of movement. That's the basic, right? One is bulk movement, that's advection. And there is going to be diffusive movement. Diffusive is vibratory, random, no directionality to, a, to an extent. But there is a diffusion. Okay. So essentially, what are these two? They are ways of transporting something, transporting a property. Okay. So that means these two terms in these two equations means these are transport equations. Correct. It is transporting something. One is transporting the momentum. The other is transporting energy. Right? So that means these are transport equations. Why is this important? And why did I call it numerically important? When you're writing CFD codes, typically, um, or the first time when you write a code, you might start by writing one full routine for momentum. And then you'll go to the next subroutine and then you will write another energy equation correct fully from scratch but actually intelligent way of coding would be to identify common terms okay so i would write a divergence subroutine and i will say when you come to a momentum equation feed in momentum terms into this and calculate if it is diffusive term feed in diffusive of the momentum and calculate it Okay, so that means I'm creating prototypes. Okay, so in open form, the first advantage, I mean, if I want to write a transport equation of something else, not momentum, not energy, but something else, then there is for this term, all I need to write is divergence of that property, whatever property I want to do. Because in open form, already the divergence module is written. The Laplacian module is written. So numerically, <clears throat> important thing is to identify 
common patterns in equations so that computational time is shortened. Okay. So now this equation is called the transport equation, which is what I've written here. Okay. Now, this is a general. I have not shown it whether it's for temperature or it's for momentum because I put a common term called phi and called it a transport equation. What are the terms in a transport equation? There is a transient term. There is a divergence, which is advection. So what we're saying here in this entire equation is saying there's a control volume. Whatever change in this control volume is changed within the volume, which is the first term. What is a bulk movement that's happening? What is a diffusive movement that's happening? Plus whatever additional source that's going to be created. Okay. So we have essentially four terms that's involved in this. Okay. So um, we have mainly terms which are advection and diffusion. Okay, the second important numerical point is, is this um, linear or nonlinear? Linear or nonlinear? Why is this of importance? Anybody? Anyone? Why is it important numerically? Whether the term which is advection and diffusion, is it linear or nonlinear? Advection is linear. Advection is linear. Anybody else? Do you agree with Harshit? Yes, I'm linear, ma'am. What if I have a momentum equation that I have to solve? Then is my advection term linear or nonlinear? <laughs> In momentum equation, it is non-linear. Absolutely. So it depends on the transport equation you are solving. Okay. So advection is non-linear, whereas diffusion, there is not much of a problem. What do I mean by this? Right. So when you're solving the Navier-Stokes equation, which is your CFD fundamental equation, how many unknowns are there? Only fluid flow, right? There's pressure. There is U, V, W velocity, correct? But when I'm going to solve this, U, V, W and pressure, all of this are my unknowns. And how many equations I have? Momentum equation and conservation equation, correct? But how will I solve for pressure? There is no specific pressure, separate pressure equation, right? So typically what is done is, you will assume an initial velocity, solve it to get a pressure. Pressure is written in the continuity equation and that is then solved as a condition. This is called the simple algorithm. I won't go into it. But the challenge here is with this nonlinearity, the advection term becomes very difficult to solve. So you have different schemes helping you how to handle these nonlinear terms if it is a momentum equation, okay? So numerically also, one needs to identify that advection is always more problematic than diffusion, okay? So we have now learned that there is Reynolds transport theorem, which is doing your conservation laws, but also that the main crux is there is a common pattern transport equation under those uh, momentum equation and energy equation, which has two terms, which is advection and diffusion. And there is a chance of one of those terms to be non-linear, which means there is specific interest for different advection schemes. So in even your... Um, commercial solvers and in open form, there is separate set of files which will allow you to choose schemes, but it is less controlled or it gives you less access in a commercial software versus open form. Open, gives, open form gives you more in-depth control to work with the schemes of each of these terms 
to make it more robust in solving. Okay, because this iterative way of solving, assuming a velocity, then giving a pressure, sometimes in complex problems where there is different velocity directions, it might crash if you don't have the correct scheme. Open form allows you to deal with these terms more carefully. Okay, so now coming to having the equations aside, how are we going to go about solving it in CFP? The background, see, my main idea is to give you what is a background way of solving it, correct? So you have what is called an entire room that you want to mesh and solve, correct? What do I mean by mesh and solve? I can take an entire room, which is this box here, and solve those three equations in the entire room. But do you think that's going to be accurate? No, because inside the room, I have a window here, a door there, a fan here. So there might be so many specific flow patterns in the room, right? So the first thing I would do is divide the domain of interest into smaller boxes, smaller control volumes to be able to solve it in the background. Solve what? The equations that I have just stated in each of these boxes. So you have the first step, which is called meshing. So the meshing is dividing a domain into reasonable number of boxes. There is an arch to this because you'll have to put more. If I'm having a big whirlpool kind of a situation, a recirculation zone in a particular part of the domain, I need more meshes there. Whereas less meshes in the other side. Okay. But you can't over mesh it because what you're trying to calculate must not become too wrong. See, when you're solving these equations, you will have some errors, numerical errors. That will build up if you do too coarse a mesh, meaning if you have too large a domain and you're solving for a big domain, then you're not able to capture. So meshing itself is an art. Okay. Now, once you've divided the domain, what it will do is you will solve the equation which I have given you in each of these domains. And then you will get a set of algebraic equations. Why? Your computer is solving it. It can only do algebraic equations. So we will have to kind of handle what is a partial differential equation. I've shown you only partial differential equations. You have to convert solve it in every domain, but convert it into an algebraic form. So that is what mainly your CFD methodology does. So let us look at it a little bit more carefully, how this is done. So I'm taking a 1D steady state conduction, right? So 1D steady state conduction will have a partial differential equation with a source term, which is this. So anyone can raise their hands and stop me. This is fundamental stuff. So I'm going a little bit more faster. But if you have a question here, you can stop me. So I've taken a rod and I've meshed it, which is the first step. I've divided it into three parts. And the second step is taking the PDE, right? And what did I say? You have to integrate it across this control volume. Okay. So what do I mean by that? So I have this conduction equation, right? And first of all, is this advection or diffusion? What term is conduction? Diffusion. Diffuse. Diffusion, correct. So that is a diffusion, right? So you conduction is purely a diffusion driven term. Okay. So you write the conduction equation and you're integrating. So for example, if this is my rod, it has three cells. My center cell is the cell of my interest. Okay, first I'm writing the equations for the center cell. So center cell is called the P cell, okay? And the cell to the west and the cell to the east, okay? So if you notice, I've kept three yellow dots representing that cell and whatever property of the cell is stored in that center point. And then you have, so that is the center point is P and there are cell walls, which will have you know, subscripts indicating this is my surface across which flux will happen. So 
So I am writing small e to denote the phase between the P and the E cell and small w for the other phase. So when I'm integrating the energy equation, conduction equation across the cell P, what will happen? I'll have the K, when I integrate this term, I'll have a K dt by dx. I'm integrating it from the west to the east, right? So that means I have k dt by dx at the east phase minus k dt by dx at the west phase plus s delta x. Delta x is the size of the cell. Okay. So I think everyone's okay with this point. So I'm going to go forward. So when I have this, what does it indicate? It's the gradient of t on the e phase minus the gradient of t in the west phase. So this gradient is a choice I will have to make. Scheme choice, right? So for this gradient term, I choose the gradients to be like this, which is E, that is for this E phase, I say E minus P divided by this distance, which is small do C. So I substitute for both these cases. Then what do I do? I see all my main unknowns. What are my main unknowns? Temperature of P, temperature of E, temperature of W, right? So I have all of these terms here and I'm going to club the coefficients of these terms together. So I've pulled out all TP terms together, TE, TW and S, okay? So you can see that the coefficients is conductivity and small delta x e distance right so ke is already known you know a conductivity of a material it's already known basis the mesh you will also know the distance between the centers so the coefficients are known numbers so i can call them as ap coefficient of this pp term ae coefficient of pe term and aw coefficient of pw term plus a body force term or a source term, right? So this is for which cell? This is for the center cell P, okay? I can move to the next cell, take that as P and write it relative to the neighbors. So you will have a set of algebraic equations, correct? Okay, so this is only with diffusion, right? So if I have an advection term, so here I'm just isolating the diffusion and advection term, then I have to integrate in the cell with both these terms, correct? So I'll have a diffusion related integration and I'm integrating the advection term. Everyone's okay till this point, I think. Okay, so I'm just going to go to the next slide. So now when you have this integrated value, you already know the gradient how I took, right? d phi by dx, I took it as Pe minus Tp divided by the distance. For the advection term, I have a phi E. Phi E means flux here, right? It's not gradient of E, but it's actually the phi E. So then I've chosen a central difference scheme where I say that it varies some way. Phi P plus phi E by 2. Okay, so this is called a central difference scheme. And what do I do now? I will substitute phi p plus phi by 2 here. And then this entire equation, I'll club all the coefficients of each of these terms together. And I'll have an algebraic form. I think everyone's okay till this point, correct? So what are the two main things you're choosing? Scheme for the Laplacian and scheme for the advection is a choice made by you. And in open form, you have to make sure these choices of schemes are correct for these two terms, for it to run, okay? Okay, so now you have meshed it. You have a system of equations, right? We have looked at system to control volume. Then we've looked at meshing, integrating the governing equation, and you've got a set of system of equations. Okay, and what do we do with the system of equations? What is the system of equations? 
let me put it. ATTP is equal to AET plus AEAWTW plus B, right? So I'm going to write it as A matrix into T equal to B. Okay, so what I will do, I will write all the T or your fees here, A matrix here and B here. So you will have a system of equations. So you will have, you will have to have a linear solver, system of equation solvers. Okay, so in your open form, we will also have a set of files or a, a particular file where you can control the linear equation solver. One file for scheme choices, one file for solving. Okay, and this is going to be a large matrix, right? Because you'll be solving for U, V, and P, at least for the flow problem. Okay, so I want you to now understand the steps for procedures. So, can anyone kind of quickly number out the steps and procedures for CFD start to end very quickly? One, two, three, four. Anyone? I'm going to call out names. So, let me unshare at this point. I think we're almost done here. Oh, hello, my audio. Yes, I can just control maybe. So, first stop step would be to discretize your domain whatever Absolutely. domain you are solving Absolutely. and then based on the flow physics you have to discretize your equations hmm. and you will get a series of linear equation and then uh, converting into the matrix and solving one so hmm. grid generation discretizing equation and the solving absolutely correct so these are your three stages okay and you have control in every stage which is your meshing um your discretization of schemes solving solver stage and then you obviously have a post-processing stage wherein you look at the results okay so what we will do now is we will first start with using the first spoken tutorial video uh, biraj will tell you which one and the problem is a square driven cavity so you have this is a standard cfd problem you have a domain or a box which has three sides, which is stationary, and you have a lid to the box, which is constantly moving, okay? And we will try and solve the flow field inside this domain, and we will see what results are coming and what are the controls that are there, okay? So first, everyone, we will start with this problem. This is how you will run an already set up open form problem. And we will come back and touch base with what we talked about in this lecture once we have finished with that problem okay so biraj take i think biraj has posted the link to the um problem that you all going to look at so i want you to like pile said follow the side by side learning mode so each of you play it and slowly follow through with it okay so go ahead biraj over to you Okay, I have already posted a link in the chat, so you guys can see the uh, that video and follow the commands uh, that is mentioned in the video. And after like uh, ten to fifteen minutes, I will also demonstrate. Uh, so you guys can proceed. Yes, and um, while you're learning and while you're doing it, if you're facing errors, please type in the chat box. There are people here to help you with uh, debugging. They'll ask you to share the screen and help you debug the issue. Okay. So I want you all to be able to um, complete this in the next 20 minutes. Take your time. It's the first uh, session. So we will go a little slow here so that you can catch on. Okay. So I think we should start off with the spoken tutorial first. And then we will come back about 15, 20 minutes and see where we are. Okay. 